You are listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. My co-host today is Michelle Jewell Shaw, teacher, mom, photographer, award-winning volunteer for Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses, an all-around good egg. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Jeremy, and hello to all of our listeners out there. Today's episode of Lighthearted is scheduled to be released on August 10th, 2020. On August 10th, 1948, Candid Camera made its television debut after being on radio for a year as Candid Microphone. 1948 is a little before my time, but Candid Camera was on and off TV for many years. I remember the classic version with Alan Funt very well. That might be a little before your time, Michelle. I think I actually remember seeing a little bit of Candid Camera when I was little. This August 10th is also the 77th birthday of singer Ronnie Spector of the Ronettes and the 61st birthday of actress Rosanna Arquette. Also born on this day in 1928 was the country singer Jimmy Dean, creator of the Jimmy Dean sausage brand. He once said, you got to try your luck at least once a day because you could be going around lucky all day and not even know it. And we're very lucky to have a really great guest today for this episode of the podcast. How's that for a segue? We're going to Ohio today. To be specific, we're going to talk about Toledo Harbor Lighthouse, and our guest is Sandy Ben, founder and president of the Toledo Harbor Lighthouse Preservation Society. Michelle, please help me tell our listeners about one of the most unusual lighthouses on the Great Lakes, Toledo Harbor Lighthouse. Sure thing, Jeremy. Toledo Harbor Lighthouse is in the western end of Lake Erie, marking the entrance to the Toledo Shipping Channel and the approach to the Port of Toledo on the Maumee River. The Toledo Shipping Channel was widened and deepened in 1897, leading to the appropriation for a lighthouse. Construction began in 1901. A large crib was sunk into place and filled with stone and then topped with concrete to serve as the lighthouse base. The buff-colored brick tower has a steel framework, and the total height of the lighthouse is 85 feet. There's also an attached one-story fog signal building. The building's distinctive Romanesque architecture has led some to liken it to a gingerbread house. A bivalve three-and-a-half-order Fresnel lens was installed, showing a light that was visible for 24 nautical miles. The light went into service on May 23, 1904. Resident keepers staff the lighthouse until its 1966 automation. There are several harrowing stories of life at the station, including the death of the first keeper from pneumonia and an explosion of a can of alcohol in 1908, which badly burned the principal keeper. To stop intruders after automation, two uniformed mannequins were placed near windows in the interior. One of the mannequins remains. With a blonde wig, she is fondly known as Sarah. The mannequins may have something to do with the origins of the lighthouse's ghost stories. Today, the lighthouse is in the care of the Toledo Harbor Lighthouse Preservation Society, an all-volunteer nonprofit organization with more than 500 members. Under the provisions of the National Historic Lighthouse Preservation Act, ownership of the lighthouse was conveyed to the society in 2007. That same year, the society won the Excellence Preservation Award from the Landmarks Preservation Council. Utilizing a grant from the Ohio Department of Transportation, a contract has been awarded to Buckeye Construction and Restoration for the restoration of the first and second floors of the lighthouse. More restoration will be completed as funds allow. When the work is complete, two couples will live at the lighthouse for periods of time, serving as modern day keepers and tour guides. The annual Toledo Bay Lighthouse Festival is held each summer at Maumee Bay State Park. This year's festival has been rescheduled to September 5th and 6th. There will be boat rides around the lighthouse, arts and crafts, lighthouse merchandise, food vendors, and more. Sandy Ben is the founder and president of the Toledo Harbor Lighthouse Preservation Society. Sandy is a former finance director for the town of Oregon, Ohio. In addition to her lighthouse work, she served as executive director of the Lake Erie Foundation and has been a member of the Oregon City Council. 
She was recognized with the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Ohio Environmental Council in 2017. I had the pleasure of speaking with Sandy Ben in July. Let's listen to that conversation now. I am speaking with Sandy Ben, president of the Toledo Harbor Lighthouse Preservation Society. We're speaking just after the 4th of July weekend, but people will be hearing this on the podcast uh, just about a month later, maybe a little bit more than that. So thank you so much for being with me today, Sandy. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having the Toledo Lighthouse. So, Sandy, uh, you have a background in finance, also in conservation, the environment, that type of thing. So what led you to get involved with the Lighthouse in the first place? Oh, that's easy. We happen to live right next to Maumee Bay State Park, overlooking Maumee Bay and Lake Erie, and we can see the Toledo Lighthouse from our home um, that we built in 1987. And in 2003, there was... Uh, session uh, introduction or history of the lighthouse at Mummy Bay State Park. We went there, and um, actually, I should digress for a second and say that we not only can see the lighthouse from our house, but when the original Fresnel lens was there, we were able to see the white, white, red flashing in our home in the evening every night. So um, the lens is the lighthouse is located about five miles offshore from where we live. So we went to the event at Mommy Bay. Um, we learned that the lighthouse is going to be 100 years old on May 23rd, 1904, um, was when it was originally dedicated. So we put together a group to celebrate the lighthouse, which eventually became a nonprofit group and, and then eventually actually took ownership of the lighthouse in 2008. We have over 400 members, about, about over 400 members right now. Wow, that's really good. So you've partly answered my next question already, but what is so special about Toledo Harbor Lighthouse? Why does it need to be saved? Well, lighthouses are history, as we know, um, around the world. But the Toledo Lighthouse is really, really special um, in that it's located on a crib five miles offshore. It's located along the Toledo Shipping Channel where Maumee Bay and Lake Erie meet. And actually, it's it has a preceding lighthouse called Turtle Island, which is a couple miles from the Toledo Lighthouse, where there were two lighthouses, both of which were destroyed by weather ice events out of the Maumee River. So they moved the lighthouse and built it in 1904, straightened the Toledo Shipping Channel, and built the lighthouse like a fortress. The reason for saving it is, A, it's a lighthouse, and I think it's important to preserve all lighthouses. But B, this lighthouse in particular is very unique. When you look at the Toledo Lighthouse, it's like none other, especially the roof, which is like the upside-down hull of a ship, which was built that way simply because the weather here is so severe at times. We have, you know, anything, we don't have hurricanes, but we certainly have tornadoes. There was one that actually whipped right, blew the window out of it. And we also have very severe winters, blizzards. So they build it so that it would never be destroyed again like the Turtle Island lighthouses were. And that's why the roof is as it was today and when it was built. Um, it's very special. And the Toledo Lighthouse is, you know, it's on a crib. It's buff brick. It's three stories with a three-story tower and um, a dry cellar with an annex on it. It's just a very special, unique structure, historic structure, and the light is still operating today, as is the Foghorn. It is very unique and beautiful. There's really no other lighthouse that looks anything like it. Of course, it gets compared to a gingerbread house all the time, largely because of its (laughs) color. (laughs) Its color is like split rock a bit, you know, but split rock, of course, is on land and it doesn't have the roof structure. So there's a couple of them that have that buff brick, but not many. It's Romanesque in design. It's really cool, and I don't think um, people come have come here and are very anxious to go into it, obviously. And when they see it, even just taking a boat ride around the exterior of it, it's a wow factor. We get just huge accolades of people saying it was so worth seeing, and we're so, you know, hoping that this will be, the restoration will be finished, and we'll all be able to go in it and really enjoy it. Before we talk some more about the preservation of the lighthouse, I'd like to maybe touch on the history a bit. There are some really harrowing stories about life at the the Toledo Lighthouse. (laughs) Yeah, and that starts with the first keeper who died of pneumonia. Can you tell me a little bit about that? 
he died of pneumonia. It was in a bad winter. And, you know, those first keepers were when the families lived there. So that ended in the 1920s, as you probably discovered in your review. Um, so it was extremely tough conditions at the lighthouse through the years when people actually stayed there in the initially year round and then later in season. So I guess after automation in 1966, uh, there were some problems with vandalism. Is that right? Big problems with vandalism. Yeah, they, the lighthouse was no longer manned after 66 and the light was automated and it was party time. And so people would go out to the light with their boat. This is one of the most um, concentrated boating areas in the world. I mean, there's a very large number of marinas, yacht clubs, um, sailing clubs, et cetera, at the western end of Lake Erie. And so people go around the Harbor Light. I mean, it's a destination if you're sailing from one of the the uh, land facilities, the marinas or the clubs, um, to go around the Harbor Light. Um, and people partied there and vandalized it. And it became pretty outrageous in the 80s. And so at that time, um, the Coast Guard was going to actually take the lighthouse down. In in our area, there was also there were also crib lights um, along the Toledo Shipping Channel besides Turtle Island that was destroyed. And the crib lights were blown up. I don't know what year it was, but so we kind of started taking away our navigation history or our water history in the area by getting rid of these facilities. And as I'm told, the U.S. Lighthouse Society um, put up a fight um, with the federal government, the Coast Guard, and the Department of Interior not to have the lighthouse destroyed, thank God, um, in the 80s, but rather to secure it. And they put about a million dollars into it in 1989, where they boarded the lighthouse up and put cement blocks in the first story windows, plexiglass in the upper floors. And then they put boulders around it, so it was very difficult to access on three of the four sides. And um, on the fourth side, they put a steel wall um, that's on the north side where the wind and the waves are the most treacherous and uh, frequent. And so getting into the lighthouse because of that remains a challenge today, unless the weather conditions are right. It's hard to access. Prior to 1989, when they um, put the money in to put the boulders around it, you know, make sure the crib was okay, uh, replace some of the brick, and preserved it, really, thank God, um, at that time. Um, but that used to be that you could access the lighthouse from two sides, and they eliminated the one-side access, which we're, you know, we are not liking a whole lot. Let's just put it that way. We're really glad they saved it. We're really glad they secured it by putting boulders on three of the four sides. You can't alter the wind conditions, if you will, in Lake Erie, which are always you know, very timely. It can happen in the spur of a moment. So, um, but we're working with it, obviously, and um, making it happen anyway. Uh, I have another question that kind of relates to the prevention of vandalism at the lighthouse. Who is Sarah? Oh, Sarah was before um, the lighthouse was secured. Um, they put Sarah in the window in hopes that they used to have Charlie and Sarah, and then it ended up being just Sarah, and there's some stories about that. But um, in the hopes that they could deter people, that they, people would think there was somebody actually in the lighthouse so that people would no longer vandalize it and go into it. And then it became customary after um, the lighthouse was preserved for the Coasties that went in there to sign her shirt <laughs> and to, um, yeah, it became like a lure. And also the people on shore, um, the stories go, were told that, you know, it was the phantom, you know, the ghost kind of phantom, and that if they weren't, the kids weren't good, that Sarah would come and get them at night. <laughs> so <laughs> um, we actually had a group, a movie group that was going to do a movie out there, a oh. ghost movie, right. and just ended up not getting the funding um, because of, you know, the ghost stories at the Toledo Lighthouse. Yeah. So do you, is there anything to ghost stories there? Do you think it's all it all stems from Sarah and, and Charlie and all that? I don't think there's ghost stories, but there certainly are bird stories and spider stories. <laughs> <laughs> <'Cause it's, laughs> when you go in there, it, it looks ghostly in some ways, uh, although we've, you know, we sleep it down and things now. When we first went into it, it was quite the web and quite, yeah, it looked eerie let's put it that way you know and when the foghorn goes off it's a little eerie you know when you're in it 
it's got that you know kind of ghostly feel to it but it's a cool lighthouse it's structurally sound and we're thrilled to have it yeah what you just said reminds me of uh, new london ledge lighthouse in connecticut which is has a famous ghost story and i actually spent a night there with an investigation team one night and the, mm-hmm. the, you mentioned the spiders. The scariest thing that happened there was I, I tried to sleep a little bit early in the morning on a bare wooden floor and woke up and realized there were spiders all over the walls in that room. Ew. So that was by <laughs> by far the scariest thing that happened there. So. Absolutely. And that, and then they have the birds that fly in. The, um, I'm trying to think of the type of bird that typically comes into it. But they kind of dive and fly. They're small. Uh, turns and, or uh, swallows or turns? Swallows. Swallows. Mm-hmm. And so they'll come in. Yeah, they'll come in. And it, we've pretty much kept them out lately. But, yeah, there's a lot of bird secretion on the top of the roof, the metal roof. Yeah. That looks, people think it's snow. Well, obviously, it's not snow. Um, but that's the bird secretion that's been there through the years. So let's talk about the Fresnel lens for a few minutes. I understand it's a beautiful three and a half order bivalve lens. It right. Was, yeah, removed from the lighthouse and replaced by a modern optic in the 90s. Uh, so right. where is that lens now? That lens went from the lighthouse. It was helicopter lifted out because it was so large. And then it ended up at some place called Kosai, a children's facility where the kids learn and then it went to Mommy Bay State Park to the lodge and it currently is at the Nature Center at Mommy Bay State Park and can be seen whenever the Nature Center is open. We really try in our organization to have anything related to the lighthouse available to the public. Mm -hmm. It's one of our big focuses. That's great and uh, it's wonderful that that lens was was saved and preserved because of course a lot of them were, were lost. I know uh, restoration at a lighthouse of that type, an offshore lighthouse, is extremely difficult. What are some of the projects that your preservation society has uh, been able to complete so far? Uh, Have you been able to carry out some improvements there? Not as many as much as we'd like, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, So let me just say before that that one of the um, reasons that we're able to maintain over 400 members and hope to actually double that this year is that we have a list. We maintain a list of members from the time that they first started belonging. It doesn't, as long as they became members, it's not the dollar amount, it's just the membership. And what that does is it gives you the right to be a keeper in the lighthouse when the restoration is completed. We will do it by seniority, literally, and give people that opportunity. Um, That has caused people to sign up and stay as members um, Mm. through the years. And the goal is um, to have four people stay in the lighthouse from spring through fall and to allow boaters and people to have access to it, to be able to tour it. We'll have a cell phone there, obviously, and um, they'll be able to make appointments to go out and go through it. So we want it to be very publicly accessible, um, weather permitting. It'll always be weather permitting um, because it's just the nature of where it's at. But... um, so the restoration, we started out by doing um, architectural plans and specifications for the restoration, and we completed those um, some probably 10 years ago. And then we were we also put up uh, initially a dock and a ramp. Um, the way to get into the lighthouse was by putting up a boat ramp, quite frankly, that had a solar um, component. We don't have electricity at the lighthouse, so it's currently using solar for the light in the in the foghorn and we will use solar also for the restoration um they there was a, a cable that went to the lighthouse from land that was severed by a ship in the 90s and it's not had electricity ever since and then that's when they switched to solar as well um to operate the light in the the foghorn but uh, we so we put up a dock and a ramp and unfortunately there was a northeastern and it it failed. Um, there's some reasons for that. Someone used it and left it part way down that shouldn't have. Um, and then we put it together a second time. And again, the Northeastern uplifted it, ended up in Putin Bay, which is like 50 miles from here. We were able to um, bring the ramp, the dock back, but we have not. Um, it collapsed again with the Northeastern wind, so we've not put them back up. We now know that we have to put the dock on the deck and then lift it down 
to be able to have boats get to it. So that was a costly big project that we ran into some challenges with. Um, today we were able to get a transportation enhancement grant through Timacog, Lucas County, and the Ohio Department of Transportation for half a million dollars. Mm-hmm. And we've been trying to execute that project for the last seven years. And I'm happy to report that this year the contract was let last month for Buckeye Restoration to do the project. And what it will do is we've actually purchased the first floor windows and shutters, so we paid for them with funds that we've raised. So they will secure the brick and install the first door, uh, first floor windows, and then we'll be able to get second story windows and shutters um, as part of this project, along with the brick and, and doors. Mm-hmm. So um, we're excited the project's starting. It will make the lighthouse look much different than it has since 1989 when the windows you know, were broken or actually should go back probably more in the 60s when it was closed. Um, so it will, you know, the first two stories will be done and then we'll have to get funding to finish the windows and shutters um, for the rest, for the third floor and then just the windows for the rest of it. And then we'll move to the um, infrastructure. So we'll have marine sanitation, we'll have gray water, potable water will be transported out there. And then we'll have, and then we'll finish it. We need about $2 million more Mm -hmm. to finish the whole thing. And then we'd have four people staying there and whatever. We're hoping that this will um, inspire people, foundations, people that love lighthouses to perhaps help us with the funding. We did naming rights to purchase the windows and do the architectural fees. Um, So we raised about $89,000 in to be able to name windows after families and companies. Uh, we're now doing store, uh, the steps, the risers and the steps um, that aren't too expensive. But we have not um, awarded the rooms. So you could actually, you know, if you were a major funder, have the rooms named, named, named after you or some major way of recognition for people who would help with finishing this project. Well, you're off to a great start. Uh, and uh, the, the work that you just talked about that's uh, about to, to happen, when, when is that work slated to begin? Um, as soon as the contracts are signed. Mm-hmm. I just talked to the county last week. So we um, are expecting it should begin before the end of the month if the contractors are at, at latest, maybe early August. And, it, and we're hoping it'll be finished. It should be finished this year. And the current pandemic situation is not affecting that work? It's not affecting the work it affected. It slowed down the process to get it to bid and all that. We actually bid it in the fall, but the bids came back um, too high for the budget that we had. So it had to be rebid, and um, we had four contractors interested, and we now have a a contractor to do the project. Mm -hmm. So we're excited about that and hope that, you know, again, this will begin the whole process of getting it restored. As far as the virus, it just it delayed getting things going a bit sure. just because, you know, governments closed their offices and there was just a lot of things that happened. But, you know, the county and TMACOG and ODOT and have just been incredibly um, helpful. It's been a challenging project in the highway projects. You know, this is a long it's a transportation project because it certainly is along the Toledo Navigation Channel. The, the lighthouse itself is still a working light, right? So... It's an aid to navigation, but it's certainly not a typical highway project, <laughs> and right. that's what their comfort zones with, right? So it, yep. it was required stepping out of that comfort zone to get all the uh, elements of this, you know, put together to make it happen. Mm-hmm. Well, it's really, really exciting. Uh, so the Toledo Lighthouse Festival is a big annual fundraiser. Uh, your organization holds, right? Not only a fundraiser, but an awareness. Yeah, when right, we started right. this mm-hmm. in, in 2004 to celebrate the 100-year anniversary, I would say maybe one in a thousand people ever heard of the Toledo Lighthouse in our area. It was really, really not known. Um, we have increased that quite a bit. It's still not the awareness that we'd like, but it's getting there. And so this would have been our 17th year. We've never, ever canceled one or done this before. Um, we have it rescheduled for Labor Day weekend, and that's still somewhat a question right now because of okay. the increasing in the virus and what's going on. It's well attended. It's always been at Mommy Bay. This year's is going to be at Toledo Yacht Club if we can hold it just because the park has um, – it was just more challenging to do it at the park. I'll just leave it at that. They've been wonderful to work with through the years. And 
you know, you can, there's a marina there and you could, we always have boat tours around the lighthouse. A couple of years, we were actually able to get about a hundred people inside the lighthouse, which people were thrilled to do. Um, we really want to do that again. You have huge demand um, for lighthouse groups that really would like to go through it. Sure. So um, it's tr- it's difficult to get the boats. We, there's no boats in this area. We have to use um, six-pack charter boats um, to go out right now um, because we don't have larger boats that can actually pull up to the lighthouse. So with this restoration project, I'm certainly looking at mechanisms to be able to get boats to be able to pull up and, and get more people into it during the restoration, if possible. It would be mm. you know, really nice for people to experience that. We really would like to do that if we can get funding and help along the way. But, yeah, the festival, we always have, you know, continuous entertainment. We have arts and crafts. We have, of course, a lighthouse area. We have the lighthouse keeper from up in um, Alpena that comes down and tells lighthouse stories. We have glass, uh, Lake Erie glass people that come and talk about glass. Uh, we have children's activities. We have a huge silent auction. It's been a fun festival, and we get a lot of repeat, you know, probably 30 to 40 percent of the people that come. Yeah. Um, try to come every year. Yep. Mm-hmm. Well, I hope you're able to do it this year, but if not, I hope maybe you'll get uh, some donations that might make up for it, at least part, partly make up for it. Uh, any thoughts to a possible virtual event of some kind if you're not able to do the, the festival this year? We're going to do, in fact, I'm ready to send it out now. The We have a 50-50 raffle we've always had, so We'll send out tickets to the members, and we'll put them on the website if people mm-hmm. would like to get them. And then we also are doing a silent auction by um, a virtual silent auction this year. We usually have it at the festival, um, but we have a local um, Pamela Rose who does this kind of thing. It's going to help us, and that you know that will be up at the end of August uh, for people to look at, and and both before August, obviously, or before because it'll be at the end to make donations to the silent auction. As well as, I mean, we'd love to have people with boat rides or condos or things that relate to water because that really is the most attractive um, part of it. But we often have gift, we do have gift cards and sports memorabilia and other kinds of, you know, usually the arts, artists and crafters give us donations. Obviously, that'll be tougher this year. Um, we usually get about 75 artists and crafters, and we were working toward almost 100 where we would have actually been sold out. So, yeah, this year was painful. But. Yeah. It is what it is, and we're all dealing with it, right, the best yeah. we can. Yeah, we are. Every lighthouse organization in the country, in one way or another, has, has uh, had a hard time this year. We'll get through it <laughs> one way or another. But uh, I have a two-part question for you. Number one, are you looking for volunteers? Is that kind of an ongoing thing? But part two, uh, how can people find out more about your organization, both you know, for possible volunteering for donating, just in general, how to how can people find out about your organization? Just go to Toledo Lighthouse Society, and you'll in the web Google it, and you'll find us very easily on our website. Um, we do, anybody can donate um, or offer to volunteer. Usually, most of our volunteering is at the festival or at sometimes we have we'll put up a tent and have you know the lighthouse at certain events in this region um, where people can do that. I don't know that we will. We've had a lot of people request to help with the final um, completion of the lighthouse to do the finishing work. I'm not sure that we can pull that together because I want to make sure it's professionally done. If there's a way that we find someone who can coordinate that, that we can help to get the volunteers to work and make it all come together, uh, we'll try, but not sure about that. The restoration is a half a million dollars is what the, the grant is for. The match that we have is 138000 uh, We have a loan for that, so obviously we're going to have to pay, pay that down. I want to thank Cleveland Cliffs Foundation. They gave us $20,000 to reduce the size of that match. Um, so that's the kind of um, those are the kinds of projects and help that we need and are working on. Wow. And I should thank Genoa Bank for providing the loan in our area. Yeah, absolutely. So here's a, a question kind of uh, from a personal standpoint. Here's a question for bonus points for you. What has been your favorite thing personally about your involvement with Toledo Harbor Lighthouse? It's really inspiring when people go to the lighthouse that have visited so many other lighthouses and the contractors that were just there for bidding on this project to tell us that it's the most unique lighthouse and 
they think it's very cool and very worth preserving. It inspires us to to keep going. But the volunteers and the people you meet are wonderful. And so it's both people and just the lighthouse itself and what it can do for the area. One thing I didn't share was, you know, this is a Toledo lighthouse that's located, as I said initially, where Mommy Bay meets Lake Erie. And the neat thing about it is lighthouses are always positive, always economic booms to the region. I'm hoping that the region will see this more and more as an opportunity to attract tourists and people, because it definitely will. Marblehead, the Department of Natural Resources, tells us attracts over a million visitors a year. And no, you know, not to put anything down about Marblehead, but Marblehead's a traditional lighthouse. It's the oldest in the Great Lakes. It's beautiful. But Toledo would be something that I think, you know, it's it's going to be something that lighthouse buffs really want to come to. And so it's an economic opportunity for this region that the region needs to see more and be willing to invest in to help us to get it done, get over the, the hump of getting the restoration completed. That uh, sums it up very nicely. And I, Sandy Ben, I, I wish you uh, the best. I know it's been a, a tough year this year, but you, in spite of that, you're, you and your organization have made tremendous progress lately. And it's ex- really exciting. It's going to be so exciting for you to see what's ha- about to happen there. And I look forward to seeing. Watch. I should add yeah. that we just bought a couple of wave runners because we live pretty close to it just to get out there really easy all the time. Uh-huh. And we'll be taking pictures as the restoration is going on once it starts. Watch the website, and I'll make sure that we post them there and on Facebook on a regular basis. So watch the transformation. It's going to be very exciting to see the cement block windows go and the, you know, the windows, real windows go up and shutters go up and give it the face that it deserves that happened so many years ago great i'll be watching that's that sounds thank good you. thank you okay. Th- sandy ben president of the toledo harbor lighthouse preservation society thank you so much for spending this time with me thank you here's some more detail on one of the stories of life at the toledo harbor lighthouse august gramer the station's second keeper was in charge in 1908 and 1909 He was suspended in August 1909 after an inquiry into his conduct, which took place after charges were filed by an assistant keeper, William Gordon. Gramer had apparently threatened Gordon's life, and he had also threatened a visiting inspector with violence. Gramer was ordered to leave the station when he was suspended, but he refused to go. A lighthouse board official soon arrived with a U.S. Marshal and two policemen. When they brought Gramer to shore, he yelled to the reporters who had gathered, Hell, you guys can't fire me. I quit. Our thanks again to Sandy Ben of the Toledo Harbor Lighthouse Preservation Society. Again, for more information on the organization, visit their website at toledoharborlighthouse.org. Thanks also to the staff, volunteers, and members of the U.S. Lighthouse Society and all its chapters and affiliates. Check out the website at uslhs.org to learn more about all things the Society has to offer, including the quarterly journal, the Keeper's Log, Lighthouse Preservation Grants, and much more. I'm gonna let it shine. Another thing the Society offers is the Lighthouse Passport Program, a fun way to keep track of your lighthouse visits. Information is on the website. I was just informed that there's a brand new stamp for the Faro Blanco Lighthouse in Florida, which is a private aid to navigation at a resort. Google the Florida Keys Reef Lights Foundation and click on Passport Stamps to find out how to get the Faro Blanco stamp and stamps for the Florida Reef Lights. If you're a fan of this podcast, please consider making a donation to the U.S. Lighthouse Society to support it. Also, if you listen through Apple Podcasts, please rate and review us. Our appreciation goes out to everyone everywhere who works to save lighthouses and their history. We're all on the same team. As always, thanks for listening and... Keep a good light.